If you have your Bible, Luke 24, beginning at verse 46. Pay attention. Sometimes, sometimes we overlook some very interesting things that if we would self-apply. Everybody say self-apply. Self we need to self-apply scripture. And he said unto them, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Everybody say in his name. Yes. Among all nations. It ain't just for the Jews. Are you hearing me? Beginning at Jerusalem. Did you see yourself in there? Say no. No, you didn't. <laughs> Not in the context I'm speaking. But I believe it's very self-applicable in the context that I want to bring this to you today. Would you lay your Bibles down? Let's lift up our hands and our voices and let's ask God that he would speak to our hearts and our minds. Give us a revelation. Allow us to experience an outpouring of his spirit and his presence. That the Lord would feel welcome in this house. That he would feel welcome to pour out his spirit upon all flesh in this house today. Lord, we ask you, we beseech you, we plead, God, that you would pour out your spirit, God, that we would truly be able to be in the presence of Almighty God. God, that you would do a great work in the hearts and minds of all that are here today. Lord, we know that the world is getting dark, God, but we pray right now that you, Lord, would pour out your spirit that we could truly be the light of the world. A city set on the hill which cannot be hid in Jesus' name. And everybody said it. Say it again. Say amen. amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I've noticed in, that God it never fails. It's either Sister Verdell or me. So not me anymore because I've been edumacated on how to turn my phone off from notifications. Thank you, Sister Erica. God chooses different than we do. He called Gideon the least of all his brethren. Out of all those strapping brothers, he chose David, the littlest, the youngest. When he needed a mother, he chose a young maiden, Mary. I could go on, but if you notice in Scripture, the Lord many times chooses the nondescript. the footnotes and not the headliners. The easily overlooked and passed over. Isaiah 62, in verses 6 and 7, it says, I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silent. And give him no rest till he establish, till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. I want you to consider Jerusalem today. I want to speak for a few moments and maybe apply some questions for you to consider Jerusalem, the great and incredible city that was the epicenter of worship in the Old Testament. From the earliest days, there's always been something special about Jerusalem. When Abraham paid his tithes to Melchizedek, he revealed a character in Scripture that we know very little about, except that he was the king of Salem, which, interestingly, was the ancient name for Jerusalem. When God called Abraham to offer Isaac on the sacrificial altar, he led him to Mount Moriah, outside of Salem. That site would later become the foundation of the temple of God at Jerusalem. There is something about 
Jerusalem. It is significant to God from the very beginning and over the course of the Old Testament as God fulfills his promise to Abraham and makes of him a mighty nation. It is Jerusalem that becomes the very center of the kingdom. From generation to generation over time, the blessings of God rested on Jerusalem. It was the exalted city set on a hill. It's the place of God's worship that was blessed with God's favor. God's house was there. God's priesthood was there. God accepted the sacrifices that were offered there. God promised Solomon that his eye and his heart would always be perpetually on that special place called Jerusalem. There's a great heritage at Jerusalem, a vaunted history of service to God and the blessings that followed the servants of the Most High God were undeniable. For years, Jerusalem was elevated in the status of the house of God. However, when Jesus gave the command that I read to you, that I'm going to read to you in Luke 24, verse 47, he said that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. How does that apply to you? When you realize when this was being spoken, Jerusalem was only a broken shadow of what it used to be. When you push past the history, you look past the highlight reel of all the wonderful things about Jerusalem that are in its history. You start to see the ugly underbelly of a city and a people that had turned its back on God. That vaunted city had backslid. The Jerusalem of the first century was a city in decay. More ways than one. It had been many years since the great victories of David. The wealth of Solomon was that made Jerusalem a city of unmatched beauty and caused even the queen of Sheba to take note. It was gone. The godly renown had dissipated. The years of neglecting God's ordinance and commands had sadly taken their toll. The real decay was not in the architecture. But in the heart and the souls of the people that inhabited that once great city. The city of legends is now the house of apostasy, faded glory, lost glory. The inhabitants of that once great city were backslidden degenerates who drifted away from truth and righteousness and fell into debauchery. They now worship the creation rather than the creator. They had replaced God with their own ideology and moral code. They had rejected the blessings and favor of heaven for godless immorality and pagan rituals. It almost seems unbelievable just as much as Jerusalem was the place where the worship of the one true God was established, it was at Jerusalem where the worship was defaced. All at the same place. And the value of the word of God was denigrated and devalued. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to know that. These other things are ritual and, and superficial, had, had invaded their lives, and they no longer truly was once the house of worship but it was now the seat of sin and hypocrisy its leaders were consumed with evil hatred and blasphemy they ruled wickedly the light of the world first first shined upon them but having loved the darkness more than the light they turned from the truth 
They hid themselves in the darkness of sin and immorality. And Jerusalem, that once great city, was now a spiritual slum. As Jesus spoke in Matthew, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Jerusalem, the one shining bright city in the world, it's a city where God moved and amazing things happened. It was a graveyard for the very men of God that the Lord had sent. It had now become the place where people laughed at the prophets, laughed to scorn the men of God. Anybody that chose to truly live for God were horribly persecuted and even murdered. This once great city of God was, was once the seat of his affection. It became the city that rejected Jesus Christ. These were the people that cried out, Crucify! Let his blood be upon us! Crucify and give us Barabbas. Give us a murderer. We don't want the healer. Give us the murderer. We don't want the life changer. They cried out, crucify. All that Jesus did and recorded was good. He had healed the sick. He had touched blinded eyes. The dead had been raised. And yet these people that witnessed that raved against him. He brought peace to troubled souls. I can't help but think about the man of Gadara after being touched, being sat at Jesus' feet and in his right mind. But they still despised him. In fact, if you remember that story, those people came out and wanted Jesus gone. Because they lost their pigs. Anybody remember that message I preached some time back? <laughs> About the pigs. He showed people love beyond measure, but they answered it with hatred and the vile venom of hell. He was a teacher, counselor. A friend of those in despair. But they closed their ears to his words. Closed their eyes to his works. And closed their hearts to his promise. And screamed, crucify. We don't want him. And even though he reached out to them with compassion. Even from the brutality of a cross. He prayed. That no charge would be laid upon them. Still, they mocked, spit, and celebrated the terribly tragic injustice of his death. That's Jerusalem. The blood of the prophets on the doorstep. The leaders willingly abused the law of God for their own. The citizens readily rejected their savior, choosing a thief and a murderer over the miracle worker. And now, truly the precious blood of Jesus is upon their hands and their children's hands for generations to come as they cry, let his blood be upon us and our children. Yet if you remember, Jesus said to Begin at Jerusalem. I find that interesting. Here's Jesus commanding his disciples to go to the very place all the men of God before have been sent have been 
criticized. Today we call it having pastor for lunch. You know, you know how you do. I didn't like the fact that you said that. I don't like the fact that he's preaching his word right as it comes out of the Bible. You know, over there, they, they don't tell you to, to repent. They don't tell you to get baptized. They don't, they don't tell you that. They just let you. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city that first rejected Jesus Christ, would receive the first opportunity at the mercy of God. This, this, this horrible place that was rejecting and despising and hating so much so that they nailed him to a cross, crucified him, would be the first to receive. Jerusalem would be the first place that the gospel was going to be preached. Because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. <laughs> the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a Jewish gospel. It is for the whole world. Every nation should hear the saving message of Jesus Christ. But God said, first, many areas of our lives it's kind of a show of honor to be the first to know the first to hear where are you let's call mom and dad I got the job let me call there's something about the first to know. There's something about being the one that gets told first. It, it, it's just still today, it still resides as a place of honor and excitement. I can't wait to tell. So here we are with the greatest news to ever hit the planet. And God chose that bitter place of Jerusalem Jerusalem where they persecuted the prophets. Jerusalem where they rejected the mercy of God. Jerusalem where they turned their back on the light of the world. Scream, crucify, we don't want him. Wow. They lifted up their voices against him and were so embraced and emboldened that they even include their children. That was where the gospel would first be preached. Now, let's be honest. <laughs> now, look, I, I know I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to be Christian and godly all the time. And I, Chris, I try. But understand, I don't get it right. Now, if I would have chosen, surely there was somewhere else that was more deserving of the gospel than Jerusalem. I'm sure in our eyes we could have justified and said, you know, there's another place where evil's not so prevalent. It's just some people look a little bit more easily or receptive to the things of God than the person over there killing people. Of course, if you read your Bible, you've heard of Saul who became Paul, but surely God should have commanded them to take the gospel to a people somewhere that had not just demonstrated in such a flagrant manner that they were enemies of Jesus Christ. Surely there was a group of people somewhere else that were more deserving. Surely there's someone else more worthy. Surely there was people more ready. So we always, well, I don't know if they're ready yet. I don't know if I can go to them yet. What are we talking about? We're talking about their ability to receive Jesus Christ versus whatever it is that they have. Are you hearing me? Surely there's someone better prepared to hear the good news because from our viewpoint, after being treated so badly, if I were Jesus, I would have said, go into all the world and preach repentance and the remission of sins among all nations. And after that, after we've done all that, let's think about Jerusalem. Well, you've done it. You've party planned before. Yeah, let's invite so-and-so. Then you get down to Bible. Do we really want to? Do you really want to go knock on that neighbor?
this house. The last resort. We, 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 that's how we are. That's how we think. But because Jesus said, begin at Jerusalem. In fact, turn to your Bible to Luke chapter 24, verse 49. I want you to read this with me. And I want you to read it for yourself to see that I'm not playing worship. It's what he said. And behold, I send the promise, the promise of my Father upon you. And he says it right here. But tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Hold on. Hold on, Jesus. Let me take you aside and speak. Look, they're killing people over there. Don't you got another place you can go to? Hold, 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 hold on, Jesus. Let me. Let me bend your ear for me. He didn't stutter. In fact, he said, go and tarry there until. You're going to stay there a while. You're going to be there a little while. You're going to be right there in the epicenter of evil. You're going to be right there, and I want you to stay there until you be endued with power from on high. Now, it's the most important moment in the history of the church. Because if you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2, now I'm going to get to, I want to get to verse 5, but you got to understand that verse 5 is an explosion from the first four verses. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly, here's that tarry until. There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now I said all that to read this next part. And there were dwelling at, everybody say it, Jerusalem, Jews, Devout men out of every nation under heaven. <laughs> when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there was a sound like a mighty rushing wind. Tongues of fire sat upon each of them, and they were all baptized with the Holy Ghost. They all spoke with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance. Before long, a great crowd of onlookers gathers around in the street. Peter, stepping up, anointed of God for this very purpose, stepped out and began to preach to the crowd that day the very first church message. Where? In Jerusalem. Right there in the middle of the epicenter of evil. Peter standing there. He preached Jesus. Now hold on a minute now. He wasn't gentle. He charged them with the murder. Nothing was swept under the rug. We didn't want to, there was nothing put in fine print so that nobody felt sticky. It was all out there. And such were some of you. The truth was told. Peter preached it so salvation could be received right there in Jerusalem. And when conviction fell upon them, the Bible says they cried out, Men and brethren, what do I do? And Peter preached the salvation message first in Jerusalem. Repent. What a wonderful thing. Repentance opens the door to a brand new day. Repentance puts your history as history. <laughs> See, you have to understand, I, I, forgiveness is great. I, I want forgiveness for my sins, but if I have forgiveness without repentance, I'm going to continue. I've taught this before, but if I walk down here and I slap Carl and say, forgive me, I go back and slap again and say, he's got to take 70 times. That's a lot of slaps. You're going to knock, get back out. But if I repent, that means I turn, I walk a different way. Yes, yes. 
That's why it says repentance and remission. I'm going to change how I'm living. I'm going to change how I'm walking. I'm going to change how I talk. I'm going to change what I watch. I'm going to change what we do in my house. I'm going to change. I, I, I don't want just forgiveness in this moment. I want to forgiveness and repent and change my ways. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now I want you to listen to me for a minute. This is Jerusalem. There's a crowd. <laughs> There's a lot of people there. That's kind of what crowd means, right? A few folks showed up. It's pretty likely that there were some folks there who had taken part in the plot to kill Jesus. That's a good probability there were some people there that may have done some other things. But can I tell you, Jesus still said, begin in Jerusalem. Go to the very ones. Go to the, Peter, Peter, go to the very ones and preach to them all. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. Baptize them in my name. The very ones that murdered me, baptize them. Is there any forgiven people in this house? <laughs> Peter said, Peter, the one that denied him, the one that had that moment, that glance, I'd, I, where he completely failed God and cursed, that he know him. Is the one that stood up amongst all the murderers and said, you know what? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did he know? Because he just experienced it. He waited and tarried right there in that wicked city and that's where God poured out his spirit upon all flesh. And there's Peter, the one that failed, standing up and preaching the very first church service. I like how he said it like this. Because remember they said when they wanted to crucify his blood be upon us and our children. Peter goes on and says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Somebody say, that's all of us. In the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He didn't stop there. He said, for this promise is to you and to your children. There were some people there that I remember what I said. to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It's very possible that right there, while this is going on, gathered in the crowd that day, some of those that mocked Jesus that was trying to worship him. Peter may have recognized that it's not. I wonder if there were some there that saw Peter fail. I wonder if there was some there that heard Peter curse. I wonder who was there when, when all this is going on. And yet all of a sudden, Peter's standing up with some boldness. And he said, and he preached to every one of them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for this promise is to you and to your children and all who are far off, even as the many as our Lord God shall call. Now, it's probably even more likely that among the crowd that day, Many that lifted up their voice. Give me Barabbas. And now they're being offered Jesus. Uh, you mean I get another chance? Oh, you're messing with the wrong preacher today. You mean I, you, you, you mean all those dumb mistakes? Uh, I get another chance at this Jesus thing. <laughs> the same men and women, the plain people, had likely screamed at the top of their bloodthirsty vision, crucify him. Peter, Peter understanding 
But in the epicenter of evil, the importance of the saying, he, he, he had felt failure. He had tasted failure. He had had Jesus look him square in the eye in the middle of his failure, stood up and said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. The remission, get those sins washed, get it all washed, get it washed away, and you're going to receive the gift, the Holy Ghost. It's a promise to you and to your children and all that are far off, even as many the Lord our God shall call. Yeah. No, 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 no. There were probably some people in that crowd who, as they mocked him, spat on him. Maybe even struck him. still remember the finger in your hand. Or maybe the pain in your knuckle from the strike you laid on the Lamb of God. You know, I, I, this is going to be a positive message, but the Lord even talked about when we go back to sin, it's like crucifying again the Lord of glory. Going back to what Oh, and here's those people there with the tingling in their hand, maybe standing there despondent, looking down, thinking, I can't be forgiven of that. And Peter says, yes, you can. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, every one of you. Those that spat on him, those that hit him, those that reviled him, every, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for this promise is to you and to your children and all that are forth. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Are you thankful? Now, I want to. I want to give you my point now of all this, and then I'm going to preach for a minute. But Lawrence, why Jerusalem? Carol, why the, the place that's the epicenter of evil? Now, I want to talk to the members of Souls Harbor for a minute. Because what I'm about to talk about is the mindset I want us to have in this church. Because yes. I want the people in this city and the people in our families and our neighbors and our backsliders and backbiters to know to understand why Jesus wanted the gospel preached first to Jerusalem and I believe it's because if God can raise up his church out from the midst of a group that had just rejected him spat on him hit him, slapped him, rejected him, and crucified him. If those people can receive the preached truth, if those people can embrace the mercy, the grace, and the love, if those who least deserved it, then there's no one out of the reach of the love of God. There's no one that can't be saved. There's no one that God won't love and reach down and save that we, hey, it's in Jerusalem. If he can have a church there, he can have a church here. If he can have a church there, he can have a church in your home. If he can make Christians there, he can make Christians here. I believe it. I believe it. He started in Jerusalem to let us all know no matter how bad it is here, it can be godly here. We can have a move of God right here. No matter how bad it was there, we can have it right here. Let's lift up our hands right now. Let's give God glory right now. This gospel is first preached at Jerusalem. And I tell you right now, this church, the 
has not changed one bit of it. You still preach it just like Peter did. Peter still get bat people still get baptized just like Peter baptized. They still repent, still get baptized, and still get the Holy Ghost just like they did then. Because the sinners of Jerusalem. were guilty of the vilest sins that ever could be laid at the feet of humanity. And that didn't stop the grace of God. And I want to tell everyone here at Souls Harbor Church that if that didn't stop the grace of God in their lives, then nothing in your life is enough to keep you from experiencing the wonders of the grace and the mercy of God here today. One of the biggest lies the devil ever told was to tell some poor soul that you've gone too far for the mercies of God to reach. You've done too much for God to forgive you. Your sin is too great. Your rejection is too flagrant. Too long. We need to go to our world. We need to go to our families. We need to go to our friends. We need to go to whoever we can and we need to tell them listen, Jerusalem had revival. Jerusalem got forgiveness. If Jerusalem, who actually crucified God, we can have it here right now. You can get restored in your home. You can get restored in your mind. You can get restored in your life. You can walk in the newness of life. We have got to give the world a message of hope. We have got to preach the message of hope. I honestly believe that the reason the gospel was first preached in Jerusalem was for our sake. Peter lifted his voice to the crowd from an upper room in Jerusalem because God wanted you and I to know that his arm is not shortened, that he cannot save. And his mercy is not lost, that he cannot forgive. Jesus told his disciples, you go back to that spiritually destitute place. You go walk right back into their epicenter of evil called Jerusalem, and you forever establish the fact that the very gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of the living God. Yeah, Jerusalem, it don't matter how evil you get, even the gates of hell can't stop Jesus. Nothing in this world can stem the flow of the love and the mercy of God. If God can start a world-changing church revival in the streets of Jerusalem, and he's more than God enough to finish the work he started in you and your home and your life, Holy God, don't believe the lie that you've gone too far for God to save you. Don't believe that lie. If he can forgive the very people who mocked him, just pat on him, he can forgive you. Don't believe the lie that has been too much done for God to save. He can still save them and you. If he can forgive the people that lifted up their voices against him, forgive us today don't believe the lie that some sin in your life has disqualified you from the mercy of God or that you've walked away from his mercy one time too many let me tell you why the gospel was preached first in Jerusalem because God wanted you to know that he can forgive anything that you've done his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting his love is an everlasting love I want you to know are you ready? This is going to be painful you to, for some of you. This is going to hurt a little bit. Those who've been out of church a little while, there were hypocrites in the crowd that day. There were some people with sin in their life that day. There were people who were all show. There were people who thought they knew all they needed to know about God. 
There were people that had all sorts of standards, but their hearts were far from him. And God still loved them enough to send a preacher to preach to them the message of mercy. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's why the gospel was preached first at Jerusalem, because someone in this church right now, someone in your family right now, someone in this city right now needs to know that God didn't reject hypocrites. Peter commanded all of them, hypocrites, murderers, slappers, liars, rapists, all, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The name they wanted to crucify was the very name they needed to be baptized in. The very name they rejected was the very name they needed. And all those that had rejected were in the crowd that day. These were the people in the crowd that day that were tired of religion. <laughs> they didn't want anything to do with religion. Tiana, they'd been hurt by religion. Even Jesus braided a whip. Walked into the crowd, threw over tables, and ran them out of there. And Peter was still sent to preach to the same guys that were around that day. Yeah, I understand. There's just too many charlatans and fakes. Too many people who professed to be godly and were consumed with selfish pride. Reject all forms of religion. We live in a world today, I meet more people now that I'm sick of religion. I'm not sick of religion, I'm sick of false religion. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They had seen too many people who professed to be one thing and lived another. But something drew them to that place. Something happened in that upper room. It attracted people's attention. People started, kind of, what's the commotion? What's going on over here? God was reaching out with mercy and grace to every hypocrite, to every person that was tired and sick of religion. Let me tell you why the gospel was preached first in Jerusalem. It was preached there because somebody in this room needs to know that God reaches out to people just like you. God's reaching out to give you something real, Something happened in that upper room. And those men and women, those people that heard Peter preach that day, were forever changed. I want to bring this to a close. Everybody say amen. amen. It's 1120. Come on, I'm, a, I'm trying to do this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the message is really simple today. Yet it is in the simplicity of a verse that simply states the beginning of Jerusalem that we can quickly overlook and not really see, Brother Corey, the really ramifications that apply to me. Paul tells us, and he uses a word in, in, in Hebrews, and I'm going I'm to say this to Paul, verse 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The uttermost. God is still able to save those in the uttermost. Now this is really a unique phrase because it appears nowhere else in scripture. It implies that
desire. <laughs> to save beyond. In other words, no sinner is beyond his reach. Yeah, that was the one that just came to your mind. You said, no way. That one. No soul is beyond his grasp. No person has fallen so far or sunk so deep in the miry clay that he cannot lift him out again. That's why in our simple text, the gospel was preached first at Jerusalem. It's an everlasting testimony Julia, that was established that God is mighty to save. That's what he's about. I said at the beginning, I want to apply it right here. Oh, Lord, bless my finances. And all the frivolous things that we ask for. And I get it, we have to live a daily nasty now and now life where the rubber meets the road. But I confess that, let me tell you something greater. Jesus saved me. Change me. God is mighty to save. His arm is not short. His mercy is not limited. His grace can reach even the chief of sinners. If he could turn and with a great mercy turn around and knock Saul to the ground. No one is so bound up in horrible oppression of sin that God can't reach you. Can I tell you the church began at Jerusalem so that you and I could know that nothing you've done disqualifies you from the grace of God. In fact, he set for you an open door. You can walk right in it today. Now understand the enemy of your soul is very skillful at figuring out ways to disqualify he wants to make you think no I do in fact the Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren think about that the accuser not the convictor he's not the judge he can't oh man some of you will get that tomorrow while you're driving to work He's the accuser. If you're sitting there right now or standing there right now, but in your mind, Pastor, don't know about that. I don't need to know. The enemy of your soul loves to interject his logic into your thought process and try to convince you and I that we aren't worthy of the grace of God, that you don't deserve God's mercy. I got a revelation for every one of us. No one is. We don't deserve it. Neither did the people in Jerusalem. But that still didn't stop God. <laughs> that still didn't stop him from going there. It didn't stop him. He didn't go there. Because they were worthy. He went there because he loved them. He's here today because he loves you. He's here with forgiveness because he loves you. Can I say something today? God isn't waiting for you to get good enough. God isn't waiting here for you to learn enough. He's waiting for you to respond. There's a merciful plea. Come to the cross. Come to an altar of repentance. There is grace and mercy from God for everyone that will come. If he can save those in the crowd of Jerusalem, turn to your neighbor and tell him, he can save you. If he can build a revival church in Jerusalem, he can build one. kind of not fair and I think it even kind of diminishes 
this verse of scripture when I call it one of my favorites. Or maybe I should call it one of the most empowering. First Corinthians. And I think it's amazing that the person that was running around and killing Christians and killing the church, the one that was birthed in Jerusalem, is the one that wrote this. I want you to listen. He's the one that wrote this. He's talking to the church of Corinth. Now, I don't have the time, and I'm, I'm going to get you out of here early. It's going to happen. Now, if you hang around and talk, you got it on me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So let, let's qualify what the power of God is. Let's qualify what salvation is. Qual salvation, a lot of people don't like this. Don't. Listen. You, just like the, the woman caught in adultery, what did he tell her to do after he forgave her? Another, go and sin. I've never been safe at home plate in baseball till I touched home plate. I had to keep my eyes peeled, my ears open, and watch everything that was going on because I didn't want to be tagged out. I don't want to do anything to get tagged out until my feet steps on gold. Yes. Until I'm seeing him face to face. Listen. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. God isn't reaching and do this great work for you to go back and do what you've been doing. Neither fornicators. That's sexual sin, guys. Now let me say something. I talked about this Wednesday night. If you weren't here, you missed these fundamental things. We qualify sin. We think big sin rules. You know what? If, if the sinner is not sin, you're either a sheep or you're a goat. You're either tear or you're wheat. You're either lost or you're not. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. Hey, there's even no politicians. We might have to edit that out. Anyway. I'm sorry, Carol. I don't know. <laughs> Shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here, but, you know, I'd like you all to be there, but I know I want me to be there. Okay. And he goes on and he makes this statement. And such were some of you. That's a lot of bad people. So, so sounds like some of our families. <laughs> but you realize, Paul, a murderer, stood there holding coats while Stephen was stoned to death. We're such were some of you because he's looking back at what Peter preached and he makes a beautiful statement here because a lot of times we stop right there and so for some of you but there's a but after a hyphen right there and excuse my vernacular but that's a really big but right there that but matters but ye are am I the only one that knows this verse washed how'd they get washed They got baptized in his name. Yes. Not titles, not formulas. His name. Yes. His name. But you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. And he didn't stop there. And by the Spirit of our God, they got baptized in Jesus' name. They got the Holy Ghost, and they didn't go back to living that way. Such were. What happened? There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. <laughs> what happened? I'm changed. 
I'm new. I'm going to go live different. I may fall, but I'll get back up again. I may trip. I may do, but I'm not going to stop pursuing him who has pursued me. Because if he can have church in Jerusalem, he can have church right here. Give God a praise right now. Give God glory right now. Give God a shout right now. Give God some worship right now. Turn to your neighbor and say, work.